Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We're one of the hosts for today's webinar. The other host is the Chicago Faith Coalition on Middle East Policy, comprised of members from diverse Chicago area, faith-based and religiously identified organizations concerned about U.S. Middle East policies and committed toward working for a just and enduring peace in the region. Today's program is entitled The Ongoing Nakba and Responsibilities for Justice, and we'll be hearing from these three distinguished uh, guests today. Today's interview is also uh, uh, co-sponsored. by the following organizations. And so I'm gonna give you a second to take a look at them. Uh, also, I want you to know that today's interview, today's webinar will be recorded. In a couple of days, it'll be posted on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel, as well as I'll be sharing it with the Chicago Faith Coalition, as well as with each one of the co-sponsors listed on the page here. Dr. Ghada Hashem Talhami retired from Lake Forest College after 25 years as the D.K. Pearson's professor of politics, where she won several awards for excellence in teaching from students and faculty. She's the author of 10 scholarly books and numerous articles on Palestine and is considered one of the leading scholars of Muslim women. She grew up in Jerusalem and remembers the Nakba from firsthand experience. Hassan Muhammad Ismail Jabber joins the webinar via a filmed interview. He is a Nakba survivor from Der Yassin al-Quds, Jerusalem. He was born August 17, 1933, 89 years old. He has six daughters and three sons and is the founder of the international brand Yassini Jewelers. Sam Bohor, at Sam Bohor, is a Youngstown, Ohio, born and raised Palestinian-American business consultant and a frequent commentator on Palestinian affairs, writing from Ramallah, Albira, in Occupied Palestine, and he blogs at epalestine.ps. So welcome to you all. Sam, um, it's always good to see you and learn from your insights. Uh, the Nakba uh, is a historical event in 1948, and it's ongoing, continuing to this very day. Uh, two days ago, May 11th, was the one-year anniversary of the targeted murder of Shireen Abu Akhle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gaza, as we speak, is under siege once again. Sam, talk to us about uh, the ongoing Nakba. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining. It's always a pleasure to be involved with uh, events from the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace and the Chicago Faith Coalition. You guys are doing tremendously important work stateside. The continuing Nakba and the responsibilities for justice, big topic. The Washington Post reported in 1988 that the person argued that Israel was built upon the principle of expelling the Arabs who lived here first. Quote, we came to conquer land and settled it, he said. If transfer is not ethical, then everything we have done here for 100 years is wrong, unquote. Those are the spoken words of a late Israeli prime minister, Rahav Zaevi a former military commander of the occupied West Bank. I say these to just acknowledge they know exactly what they've done and what they're doing. The literal translation of Nekbe is catastrophe in English, but the essence of the Nekbe is much more multi-layered than a single word that depicts the state of affairs that befell Palestine and Palestinians 
with the creation of Israel. We must understand that the Nekbe was not merely an event in history, but rather a premeditated phenomena of settler colonialism, a structural reality, a reality based on violence, not only bloody violence, as we see today in Gaza, Jerusalem, and across the West Bank, but violence of unimaginable proportions against Palestinians living in Lebanon, Syria, and elsewhere around the region and the world. Israel's violence does not stop there. Most of their violence is unseen by the naked eye. It is administrative violence, legal violence, educational violence, and more. I must ask, as we view today's Israeli government, for whom is the 200, 2023 Israeli government the worst in Israel's history? Certainly not for Palestinians. Allow me to reflect on this government and previous governments. Previous Israeli governments dispossessed three quarters of the Palestinian population from historic Palestine in 1948, looting their homes and personal belongings. All Israeli governments prohibited and continue to prohibit Palestinian refugees from returning home. All Israeli governments refused and continue to refuse to allow internally displaced Palestinians inside the state of Israel to return to their homes, even when the Israeli Supreme Court ordered it so, as in the case of Ikrit and Kufr Bir'a. Previous Israeli governments imposed military rule on all Palestinian citizens in Israel proper from 1948 to 1966. Previous Israeli governments launched a military occupation in 1967 in the Palestinian West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, Syria's Golan Heights, and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. All Israeli governments established or expanded Israeli settlements, illegal settlements, and sustained them with everything from security, subsidized transportation, water, and airways for their telecom services, just to name a few of the perks Israeli Jewish settlers enjoy from the state of Israel. Previous Israeli governments and today's sealed off 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip from the outside world, periodically bombing them like today, killing hundreds over the last years. All Israeli governments pillaged Palestinian resources. For example, our water, our stone and marble quarries, our frequencies for telecom, our natural gas, our Dead Sea salts, our custom fees, the list is long. All Israeli governments killed and killed with impunity. All Israeli governments imprisoned Palestinians without charge or trial, calling it administrative detention. All Israeli governments and today's collectively punished Palestinians, a war crime in international law. All Israeli governments and today's systematically ignore international law, starting from its founding membership commitments to the UN. All Israeli governments defied and defy UN resolutions to the tune of 754 General Assembly resolutions, 97 Security Council resolutions, 96 Human Rights Council resolutions. Previous Israeli governments passed the nation state law in Israel, which enshrines Jewish supremacy between the river and the sea. I can go on and on, the list is very long. There is nothing new in this current Israeli government except its brazenness. Israel, Israelis do not need a new government. They need a historical reset to correct the historic wrongs which have come home to haunt them today. Regarding responsibilities for justice, where are we Palestinians to go? What are we to do? When Palestinian refugees tried to fight their way back home, 
they were punished. When Palestinians adopted civil revolt, they were punished. When Palestinians entered a five-year interim agreement to give peace a chance, they were punished. When Palestinians responded to Israeli provocations with violence, they were punished. When Palestinian civil society adopted nonviolent resistance like BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and hundreds of other nonviolent tools, they were punished. When Palestinians held free and fair elections, they were punished. When Palestinians go to the UN to gain membership, they are punished. We went anyway. And the majority of the world has recognized the state of Palestine, that is, the new and truncated state of Palestine. When Palestinians go to the International Criminal Court of Justice, we are punished. We went anyway, and we are still, still trying to advance our first case against Israel, even while watching hundreds of cases within the last several months being open against Russia for its occupation of Ukraine. When Palestinians go to the International Criminal Court, we are punished. We went anyway to hold those individual war criminals in Israel responsible for their acts. When Palestinians defend their cities, villages, and refugee camps from what journalist Saeed Arakat calls the gangster state of Israel, we are punished. All of these and much more. When combined is what I mentioned in the outset, premeditated phenomena of settler colonialism, a structural reality, a reality based on violence. In closing, I'd like to highlight in a little bit more detail, three cases in point. Case number one, administrative detention. Over 1,014 at last count, Palestinians, are being held without trial, without charge, without hearings. This is the highest number of administrative detainees in the last 20 years. Overall, since the occupation started, 850,000 plus Palestinians have been held in detention, some for days, some for months, some for years. Of those 151 children, are in military detention as of March 2023, as reported by Military Court Watch. One case in specific is my cousin. He just was released two weeks ago from prison. He's 76 years old, Palestinian American businessman. Second time he's been held in administrative detention. This time it was for eight months. His name is Jamal Nizer. He was released, and on the day of his release, they told him, because he's desiring to go to the, visit the States to deal with some eye problems caused by diabetes, you can leave, because they were prohibiting him to leave for the last five years, they told him you can leave under one condition, that you sign that you will never come back. Of course, he's still in Ramallah today. Economic strangulation is the second case in point. Not one sector of our society was fully transferred to the Palestinians during the Oslo process, not one. Today, every aspect of our economy is micromanaged by the Israeli military occupation. Yes, we have a Palestinian government. Yes, we have ministers but they can only work within the margins of what the Israeli economic desks in the civil, civil administration, which is a military administration, permit them to do. In that Israeli military administration, there are desks. There's a desk for agriculture, a desk for uh, development, a desk for energy, a desk for you name it. The Israelis are sitting there managing our economy, dropping crumbs of economic resources on the Palestinian government to manage, not enough for them to be able to succeed by any stretch of the imagination. One bold example of this economic pillage that's happening is our natural gas fields 
found in the Sea of Gaza in 1999. It's called Gaza Marine. It's estimated to have 32 billion cubic meters of natural gas. That's about 1 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It is valued over $8 billion, which would relieve us from our dependency on donors and on Israel. But Israel refuses to allow us to extract the gas, even when Palestinians partnered with British gas and then Shell, still the Israelis refuse to allow us to have access to our natural resources. It's premeditated, it's part of the Nekbe. Like forced fragmentation, Israel is bent on forcing us to remain in economic dependency. The last case in point is necroviolence. I had to look up the word when I actually first heard it. It means the confiscating of dead Palestinian bodies and using them as bargaining chips. These bodies are held in Israeli freezers at below 50 degrees Celsius. Today, there are over 120 dead Palestinians being held in Israeli freezers. Add to that bodies buried in what we refer to as the IDF's cemeteries of numbers, there's three of them, and you have hundreds of grieving Palestinians sitting home, building up an appetite for revenge. For the record, an Israeli commission of inquiry appointed by the Israeli chief of staff confirmed that by July 2000, many years ago, three cemeteries of numbers were used by the Israeli army where a total of 349 Arab and Palestinian martyrs had been secretly buried. Today, the number is much higher. My question to the protesters in the streets of Tel Aviv, what value does your government get from bargaining in dead Palestinian bodies? And why are you not calling them out? One can go on, but time here is limited. So I refer you to four resources. One is my blog, epalestine.ps. It has many suggested readings and documentaries. The second is visualizing Palestine's website to see their infographics about the various aspects of this occupation and Nekbe. The third resource specifically is a book I highly recommend. It's titled Stranger in My Own Land, Palestine, Israel, and One Family's Story of Home. It was written by a friend of mine, Fida Jirias, and it is a one book read to understand the last hundred years of the Nekbe and where we are today. And lastly, I would point you to a recent article in the Jewish Currents. It was published on April 19th by my friend and journalist, Peter Beinard. And he asks in the title of his article, could Israel carry out another Nekbe? And when you read it, you understand that the elements of a Nekbe are in the DNA of Israel and the Zionist movement. And we are very close to seeing another Nekbe happen. And I think Gaza is an indication of that. Thank you. Hmm. Well, Sam, uh, uh, powerful, powerful. Uh, insightful, passionate, and uh, uh, you give us much to uh, ponder and reflect upon. So thank you. Gada, I'm going to ask that you unmute yourself while I uh, 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 introduce you. Um, you have first-hand experience, Gada, of uh, the 1948 uh, Nakba. Um, please unmute yourself now, Gada, if you don't mind. Um, so what stories, Agata, uh, what stories, images, and memories would you like to share with us uh, from the 1948 Nakba? Thank you, Gada, for joining us. Thank you. Well, what I remember clearly, and I was uh, quite young, is a state of confusion. People not knowing what to do and where to go in 1948. Uh, if you were lucky enough, you moved with relatives. 
if you were not lucky enough, you had to pick up and go to another country if you can. So that's really the, the gist of it is a terrible relocation or dislocation, I should say, from your own home to somewhere else. There's also, there was also no hope really of returning. I mean, you just knew it. You left and you really couldn't go back. So you had to do as much as you can to settle somewhere else and make a new life for yourself and for your family, which again was quite tough in 1948. Uh, most people were really lower middle class economically, you know, most Palestinians, if not poor, poor farmers. And so there isn't much to go on economically to speak of. People were really hard put to make a living, to find a way to feed themselves and feed their families and do something else. Uh, all I also remember is the other neighboring Arab countries were not really that hospitable. I mean, even Jordan, nearby Jordan, was not really that hospitable to incoming Palestinians because these were considered to be a new threat, new refugees coming in, new people to live in the camps. If you lived in the camps, you had to live on United Nations uh, dole, uh, daily dole of, of food, which was very minimal. If um, the majority of people actually did live in the camps. If you lived somewhere else with relatives where you had could find a living, you were really better off. That's about all I could remember from those years. Again, I was quite young. I wasn't really as old as I am now. Yada, uh, thank you for sharing uh, um, your um, memories. Um, this idea of dislocation, not relocation, but dislocation and no hope of returning. That, um, I'm just trying to process how I would experience that and the emotions that your family uh, must have felt and even you as a child. So thank you. To introduce the filmed interview uh, of our second 1948 Nakba survivor, Rama Atia, a member of American Muslims for Palestine in Chicago. Rama, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself and uh, you can take it away from here. Thank you, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great honor to be amongst all of you guys today. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join this discussion. Um, so as you can see, for Palestinians, the Nakba, you know, is, you know, stories of endless hope to return, demolished homes, stolen land, stories of displacements. Um, there's stories of um, borders, more borders than you can ever imagine. There's different paths that everyone took um, and, and, and refuge. There's the orphan child, the broken dreams. So the Nakba is not a one-time event. It's not only a tragic memory of the past, it's over 75 years of the same treatment. The 1948 Dariusin massacre was a, was a blueprint for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. It was such a horrific um, ex, um, experience that the news of the atrocities spread to the neighboring villages and that, and that news um, led the, the, the people in the neighboring villages to flee um, barefooted with even just the clothes on their back out of fear. And this is what leads me to our next guest. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us live due to health restrictions, but he kindly invited us to his home to conduct the interview. Hassan Muhammad Ismail Jabber is an 89 year old man. I know um, Mike introduced him and kind of um, said a little bit about him in the beginning, but he was a man of great wisdom and virtue. He resides in the South suburbs of Chicago. He's the founder of Yassini Jeweler, like he said, like Mike mentioned, um, an international brand, uh, the father of six daughters and three sons. And he's not only a Nakba survivor, he is also a witness to the horror and violence and violence that took place in the village of Dar Yassin. Um, which is better known as the 1948 Dar Yassin Massacre. Um, before we start the video, though, I really, you know, when I, I, I kind of watched a little bit of the video, I 
really had to, you know, um, see him as a 14 year old boy. And I wish that you would do the same and kind of like imagine the amount of trauma he faced during the time that he was telling, that he's telling his story. Um, so I can't even fathom, just like Mike said, it's hard to believe like what Gada went through as well, um, the, the type of violence that they witnessed. Um, Ala, can you start the video? Yes, sure. Let me share. Yeah. أخوكم في الله طبعا حسن محمد اسماعيل جابر ابو ياسين بقول ابو ياسين من دير ياسين مواليد 17/9/33 ولدت في دير ياسين دير ياسين يعني هي 2 كيلومتر غربي القدس احنا قبل سنه 48 كنا عايشين في دير ياسين دير ياسين يعني كانوا أهلها سبع حمايل بس كانوا معيلة واحدة بيحبوا بعض بيشاركوا بعض بالأفراح كانت البلد آمنة فيش فيها ولا أي نوع من التجاوزات متحبين أهل البلد على قلب رجل واحد كان فيها كسرات محاجر مقالة حجار كانت مشهورة بعدين مزارعين أهل البلد فيها جميع أنواع الفواكه كل أنواع الفواكه جن وكانها جنة أبوي أجا واحد قال له يا أبو سليم أخوي آه سليم قلنا قال له الخواجة الفلاني بده قطعة الأرض تبعك اللي جنب المنتفيوري قال له اطلع اطلع قال أبوي وهو يحكي معه في حاطين على البابور الشاي اللي انسلب الشاي على رجلي أنا هذه قال له بس دخل بس بس فت على ظهري طلع هي الحركة اجى الولد عني اطلع طرد ابوي ابوي ما بعدش ارض ما ابى ابى اطلاقا يعني مش ممكن واحد ينسى هذيك الايام اطلاقا ما بنساها ابدا يعني كان في مدرسه بنات ومدرسه اولاد اخوتي كانوا يعني اربعه كان سليم استشهد في دير سليم موسى أول واحد صاوب في دير ياسين أصيب بجروح في دير ياسين كان هو يحارب في القصبر على سليم وموسى ومحمود ومحمود وحسن ويحيى فوات فوات السنتين الكبار أمينة زينب زينب فاطمة مريم حليمة صار ست خوات بس بدأت المعركة الساعة ثنتين تقريبا قبل الفجر أهل البلد مستعدين اليهود كيف هجموا من ثلاث محاور يعني المحور الشمالي والمحور الجنوبي والقلب أما أهل البلد في الساعات الأولى دحروا اليهود اللي جايين يكملوا الطوق من الجنوب ومن الشمال وصارت الجبهة الوحيدة وين في الشرق حتى اليهود كبدوا خسائر كبيرة اللي كانوا بدهم يكملوا الطوق وهان صار في مجال ان الاطفال والنسوان واللي بدهم يطلعوا يطلعوا من البلد يطلعوا طبعا غربا ثم يروحوا جنوبا على عين كان فهان امكن اخلاء مين الامن المرضى والنسوان اللي اللي اللي, اللي بعيدين عن ساحه المعركه اللي في الشرق في الحاله هذه يعني المعركة كانت أسهل إشي وين في, في, في قلب البلد بس هي شرقا المعركة حملة 12 ساعة 12 ساعة من, 12 من سنتين لسنتين تقريبا اليهود استعملوا رصاص الدم دم 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 هذا كنا دم دم تنفجر رصاصة في جسم الشخص اللي بتصيبه من تطلع من البندقية برضه بتنفجر رصاصة بجسم الواحد بتصيب صبايا كان يعني يحاولوا يعني يقضوا على الحصن تبعهم 
واستعمل مدافع الموتر ومدافع الهاون وبعدين وصل لبعض الدبابات يعني كانت مطبوعه الطريق طموها بالدرافات وفاتوا ومع ذلك ما احرج اي تقدم ظلت ظلت الجبهه هي هي وما فاتوا على وصف البلد اطلاقا الا بعض البيوت اللي في شرق البلد يعني هذول احتلوهن لانه كانوا اهل البلاد غالبا طالعين من جنوب وجايين على وصف البلد لانه ما بيقدروش يدافعوا عنهم بيت هنا وبيت هنا وبيت هنا يعني ما بيقدروش يدافعوا عنهم هذول اليهود اخذوهن وبعدين يعني في الحاله هذه اسروا بعض الناس نساء واطفال وبعض الرجال يعني اللي دهموهم بالاول هذول شرق البلد فدهموهم اليوم ما تمكنش انه يطلع اخذوه طيب صفوهم وقفلوهم الاسرى اللي صاروا عندهم شيء صحيح انهم صفوهم وقتلوهم؟ اي نعم اللي 12 سنه كانوا يقتلوه ابدا بس النسوان اللي اخذوهم يعني كشطوهم السلاح والحلق وها وارموهم في بوابه بند البم عند السفاره الامريكانيه اه اما اللي عمره 12 سنه فوق يعني اللي كان هيك من واو اكل حتى اللي ما فيش سلاح اللي مش سلاح ولا شيء كانوا يطخوه جيش الانقاذ جيش التحرير وجيش الانقاذ هذول عباره عن سوريين وعراقيين كانوا داخلين لنجد عبد القادر الحسيني في القسطنطين هذا جيش الانقاذ كمان ماكو اوامر ما في اوامر شو اوامر ناس بدها تموت اوامر وما اوامر شو الاوامر هاي يعني ما في شيء كان اول شيء احنا ما فيش تنسيق يعني كل واحد بيعمل زي ما بده وبده اياه بيسويه قياده موحده ما فيش هذا سهل على اليهود انهم يخلوا يعني البلاد وعي كامل ما فيش بيعرفوا شو بده يصير بكره ولا شو المخططات تبع اليهود ولا شو الانجليز يعني بتدبر لهم فهم راحوا ضحيه وبعدين يعني ما كانوش يشوفوا البعيد الجيوش العربيه دخلت بعد تسعه اربعه بعد بكثير يعني هذا البلد ضل طلعوا من دير ياسين على سلوان وبعدين حاربوا في النبي داوود في الجبهات الساخنه في القدس قبل ما يدخل الجيش الاردني عن عباره عن مقاومين يعني ثوار من اهل البلاد قبل ما يدخل الجيش الاردني اما فيها بعدين دخل الجيش الاردني يعني ما في وقت بردنا ما كانش الجيش الاردني ما كان اطلاقا كانوا هذول عباره عن مناضلين بقولهم متطوعين يعني مثل جيش هذول فوج الكوكزي كان كل السوريين وكان في عراقيين بس ما دخلوش ما 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 قبلوا يساعدوا اهل بلدنا وصلنوا من النسوان بالاول دير ياسين دير ياسين ولا واحد رد فهذا في الحال هذا بيرجع للمعركه المعركه صارت الساعه 2 ما ظلت معهم ولا اي فشكه اطلاقا خلص من فشك والعتاد تسعه عتاد والله النسوان اشتركن في المعركه النسوان اشتركت بكان يخلين اللي يستشهد ياخذ السلاح ويسلم للي بقاومه وسلاح ودفيره بعدين يعني اشهر النسوان اللي اشتركن والدتي الله يرحمها جميل احمد صلاح ظلت والله من اول معركه لاخرها وهي بطولها واحد من بلدنا اسمه علي كاشم هو اللي ابلوا بلاء حسنا في معركه دير ياسين في صميم المعركه يعني اكثر الناس اللي يذكر اسم في دير ياسين هذا علي كاشم علي كاشم حميده هذا جاء طلق من هان وهو مقبل وليس مدبر يعني يعني أنا أمي أبت إن تخليه من سحبته وحطته على كرسي وجابت مرة ثانية إلقي عليه وحمد عظمه وأطلعته الله يطلع من البلد وخلف بعد ما طلع في معلمة البلد معلمة البنات من القدس اسمها حياة سالم البلبيسي لما كنت ماخذ خواتي أنا بدي أطلع خواتي الصغار عاملين إياه لأنه أنا ما صارش مجال إني أنا أعمل سلاح لأن الواحد كان يبيع 
سيرة مرته ويشتي برودة ما كانش السلاح متوفر فأنا شافتني هذه المعلمة والله على ما أقول لك فيه قل يا أخوي مش معك خطة ألبسها والله مستحية أطلع والله لا أنت والله مجدد وش أثنت فأنا أنه طلت اجتهد الدرح وهذا والله وش أشهد في البلد ما طلع استواها تبع دير يسير ظلوا كلهم في ساحة المعركة ما أخلينا ولا واحد لأنه ما في مغلش عتاد اللي يقدروا يعني يخلوا اللي استشهدوا يعني حتى يعني انسحابهم كان معجزة من الله سبحانه وتعالى اللي ما قضوا عليهم اليهود يعني كيف كان الناس يغطوا الناس لما لما انسحبوا أما اللي طلعوا بس مش اللي بيحملوا السلاح اللي بيحملوا السلاح ظلوا في البلد اللي طلعوا النسوان والمرضى والولاد بس هذول هذول طلعوا لما فكوا الطوق ورحتوا وصلتوا العين كارم؟ وصلنا العين كارم ماشي طبعا كانوا يعتقدوا ال ال العرب تبعينا لما دخلت الجيوش العربيه طبعا بعد ما طلعنا احنا من البلد انه ما باسبوع احنا مرجع فلسطين فاجئوا ان اليهود عدد اليهود المسلحين والمتدربين اكثر من هذا الجيوش العربيه اللي دخلت على فلسطين فاجئوا وبعدين احسن تسليح واحسن تدريب واكبر عدد بعدين الانظمه العربيه كانت تتعرض لضغط خارجي مثلا عندنا احنا الله يرحمه قائد الجيش الاردني في القدس يعني كان اسمه عبد الله التل انسان يعني رجل يعني قوي بكل معنى الكلمه ورجل يعني عنده وطنيه رجل مؤمن احتل القدس وبعدين اضطر انه يرجع نتيجه ايش؟ الضغوط البريطانية أو إحنا يكون إنجليز ولا لو كانوا يعني الأردنيين يعني مع العراقيين يعني كانوا صحيح فيش عليهم ضغطات كان كان اختلفت النتيجة تابعنا المسير ل للقدس طبعا عن طريق المالحة بعدين بالصبا بعدين القدس تلقون أهل سلوان أهل سلوان سلوان وكأنهم وكانهم الانصار واحنا المهاجرين كل عيله اخذت عيله أو والله والله ما شفنا منهم الا كل خير بيوتهم اخذوا جريسين كلها هي بيوتنا والله اكل وشرب وتعلمت وكملنا في المدرسه عندهم والله وكان يعني يعني شو بدي اقول؟ يعني مهاجرين وانصار اذا بدك الوصف الصحيح مهاجرين وانصار ما واحد شاف منهم هذا يعني يطلع على بنت ولا على مرح ولا على شيء ولا ولا يعني كسرة والله ساعدونا احسن شعب الله سبحانه وتعالى يعني املنا بالله ان في يوم من الايام لازم ترجع فلسطين ولكن المفروض علينا احنا في الوقت الحاضر هو ان احنا تثقيف اولادنا ان كيف احنا انت فلسطيني انت مثلا من دير ياسين الا لما بسال انا ابني ولا ابن ابني اقول انا من فلسطين وانا من دير ياسين يعني هو مولود هان وعمره ما شاف دير ياسين وبعدين احنا صار قصتنا كيف راحت بلدنا واحنا لنا وطن والوطن هذا احنا اجبرنا ان بالحرب ان يعني نهاجر وان نصير هذا المحل ولكن لنا وطن لا تنسوا فلسطين يعني احنا اذا بنثقف اولادنا الثقافه هذه وبنحط يعني عندهم بذاكرتهم ان لهم وطن والوطن هذا يعني خسرناه في الحرب يعني ولما تسمع تسمع الظروف ان شاء الله بنرجع على بلدنا واحنا بلدنا يعني كلنا من دير ياسين للاقصى ساعه
Well, uh, thank you to Hassan Mohammed Ismail Jabber and our friends at uh, American Muslims for Palestine. And Allah, thank you so much uh, for uh, your help too. Sam and uh, Agada, um, you know, a couple of names came out uh, in, in Hassan's conversation. Um, uh, these uh, refugees from Dar Yassin were taken into Silwan, and now Silwan is under siege, right? And uh, home after home after home are being destroyed. So that's number one. I'd like for Gada and Sam to maybe uh, uh, respond to. And the other thing is, uh, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong, but Yad Vashem in West Jerusalem is this. Uh, it's this structural metaphor, right? You go in and you de descend as the horrors of the Holocaust, right? And the horrors of anti-Semitism uh, uh, get a stranglehold on Germany. And then you ascend and ascend. And then you reach this big plateau at the end where uh, uh, Israel makes the desert bloom. And you look out over this forested area. Isn't that built? Isn't that the ruins of Dar Yassin? So anyway, uh, Gada and Sam, if you could respond. Gada, why don't you go first? And then Sam, I'll let you pick it up from there. Gada, please unmute yourself now. And both of you can kind of uh, remain unmuted now for a while as we have a conversation. Gada, please unmute yourself. Yeah, that is the ruins of Dar Yassin. I mean, we know where it is. And it's it's a memorial. It's kind of a memorial that people remember all the time for what happened there. So we, we like to go there sometimes and we like to visit sometimes. It is, it is a memorial. Sam? Those are powerful words, I have to say. Yeah, it, I was moved to right. silence, really. I mean, I didn't yeah. have to respond, actually, right? I, I actually co-edited uh, co co an edition of Oral Histories of Palestine and Palestinians with the late Stan Lind and his wife, Alice Lind. And we, were, we, we looked for people like Hassan, uh, older people who have a recollection. And his made me remember that entire process of collecting those and publishing them. I would mention a couple of things. First is, there is not a location in Israel that doesn't have a Palestinian history to it. And more recently, there are Israeli filmmakers, which are doing amazing work, by the way. And one specific film that came out, a documentary called Tantura, a couple of years ago, talks about a specific village inside the state of Israel. And they speak to the Israeli military people, elderly folks, who corroborated the Palestinian story. Um, the link to that is on my blog. Those are the kind of stories where Israelis have a very, very hard time challenging because it's the people that undertook the war crime itself that are saying, yes, we did it. And sometimes they're chuckling while they're saying it as if it's a, you know, a joke long gone, not understanding that the people who lived that, like Hassan, are still living today. The other thing I would mention is, a, you know, there's a location at Tel Aviv University. Tel Aviv University sits on what used to be Tel Rabia. Mm -hmm. Again, every location in Israel is built on the ruins of something Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the good work of Dr. Slimana Bosite, a Palestinian historian about the Nekbe, has revealed in a very documented and geographical way that the majority of locations that were depopulated remain empty today in Israel. Think about that for a second. The majority of locations are empty. Tel Aviv is not, Tel Aviv is not, there's a university on it. Where the airport is, is not, but the majority of locations are empty. As the residents of those locations dwell in squalid refugee camps around the region, waiting for 75 years to come back home. The last thing I'll mention here is I, I'm uh, focused a lot these days on documentation. 
And during the last decade, we've seen Israel declassify documents because the time limit has expired on the classification. And as soon as they declassify groves of documents, Israeli historians went and gobbled them up, analyzed them, and published books which confirm again the Palestinian narrative of the Nekbe. And one story is that someone read one of those books, didn't believe it 100%, went to the footnotes to find out exactly what documents he was reading from, went back to the Israeli archives and requested the documents, only to find they were reclassified after the book came out. In addition to that, about four years ago, there is a unit tied to the Israeli prime minister's office, Netanyahu's office today in the last period of time, which is sole duty is to cleanse the archives of incriminating information. You have something to hide when you start destroying classified documents, when you reclassify documents. Israel needs to face up to the facts of history if it ever wants to go beyond where it's at today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Zada. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, two days ago, uh, May 11th, was the one-year anniversary of the targeted murder of Shireen Abu Akhle. You know, and uh, Gaza's under siege. Every day uh, there's bombings and just killings of Palestinians, one, two, three, or more. But I've, I've also noticed, and this has been happening for a while now, it's not just political leaders or resistance leaders, but more to the point, attacks on Palestinian cultural leaders, leaders in the arts, and especially the Palestinian press and the foreign press too. And maybe that picks up on what you're talking about, Sam, a little bit. Yesterday's Mondo Weiss headline, Shireen Abu Akleh's killing made clear that Israel's war on Palestinian journalists is part of its war on Palestine. Can you talk about that, uh, Gada, in, in terms of the ongoing Nakbe? And then, Sam, you can pick it up from there. Well, obviously, anybody like Shirin Abu Akhle, who is a voice for Palestinians, uh, becomes the target. It's, this is quite obvious. And it's obvious that Palestinian voices are still heard outside of Palestine, I mean, all over, in the press, uh, in their own writings, wherever they go. So yeah, they could become targeted very easily, and I'm not surprised at all. Thank you. Sam? Yes, I think one needs to understand the extent of the oppression that we are under. Every Palestinian is a target, either by precise targeting of a specific person, and as you said, the culture and arts has been a target. The leaders in that, have, that sector have been a target ever since Lebanon. Uh, people like writers Ghassan Kanafani, others, Kamal Nasser, over history, they have targeted the people who give voice to the Palestinians. Shireen is only the latest. There's actually 20 some journalists who have been killed here during the last several years. Absolutely. Um, but it's not only journalists, it's not only artists, it's everyone. And when you see, I mean, I'll give you two stories. I mean, my mom is always worried about me. She's in Ohio and I'm in Palestine. And she's always nervous that I'm here. And I tell her why, I mean, I'm okay. She goes, no, I know you're okay at home, but you like to put on the radio with music when you drive. And my fear is you're going to approach a checkpoint. They're gonna tell you to stop because they yell it out and you don't hear them. You're a dead person. Another example, I mean, today I called two friends of mine in Gaza. One of them is Mohammed Mahenna. He's a 29 year old dozen who had a medical condition similar to his sister's. His sister's died from it. He, he got through it and he made it and he's growing. And I called him to find out how he's doing after these five days. And he basically said, we're okay, but we didn't sleep last night. We, the entire family was risen by the bombing happening around his home. And then two hours later, I saw the newscast of a four-year-old Palestinian in his home with his parents died of a panic attack because of the same bombs that Muhammad was hearing. It's not all what you see on TV. The carnage is 
what you see. And as I noted in my opening comments, what you don't see is things where there's no cameras to cover, like those other journalists that were killed, or all of the layers of administration, administrative oppression, administrative occupation that nobody can take a picture of. Someone has to explain it to you to see. So I think that the goal to understand here, to make sense of what's happening, if one can even make sense of it, is as long as you're a Palestinian in Palestine, you are targeted. As long as you're a Palestinian in the refugee camps abroad, calling to go back home, you are targeted. And that's what makes this situation all the worse. Sam, uh, I want to pick up on this, and I'm going to ask you first, and then Gada, you can uh, respond as well. You've written eloquently, I, picking up on this idea of what we don't see. You've written about this, uh, about you know the importance of alternative solidarity tours. I mean, you meet with groups. My God, how many groups do you meet with every week? You know, you meet with, and you're going to be meeting with our group next month. But you've also written about the weakness uh, in some of those alternative justice tours, like many of us lead, what we won't see and what we don't see and what we don't hear. So say a little bit more about what don't we see, even on tours that are that are with you, that are part of solidarity with Palestinians. Trips here are important. Seeing part of the reality gives a color to the occupation that you don't get by just reading the reports, even though the reports are plentiful these days, like that of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and Beit Salem and Yeshdin, they go through the meticulous detail of all that's happening here. That's all very, very important, but it doesn't equal crossing a checkpoint. It doesn't equal having an M16 pointed to you as you're sitting in your car. It doesn't equal Israeli soldiers like they've done twice already to my home, knocking the door in the middle of the night, taking you outside and searching your home. It doesn't equal not only the administrative detentions that I spoke about, but the fear of administrative detentions. My wife does not sleep well. Every squeak she hears outside, she jumps out to look to see if it's the army. So the, the overwhelming uh, environment is one of violence, even if you're never arrested. You are put within that environment, that ecosystem, uh, in addition to things like bodies being held. You can't see the fervor that's being fermented in those houses who have a loved one that's in an Israeli freezer. He's dead. It's over. He may have been wrong. He may have not. It doesn't matter now. He's, it's over. Without releasing those bodies, Israel just continues to instigate the families to aim for revenge. You don't see all of that while you're here. You don't see the prisoning, the prison system. I can go on it. You don't see that we don't have frequencies in the air to be able to provide 4G or 3G in Gaza. Uh, we've been you know, negotiating with the Israelis now for five years for 4G frequencies. President... Biden came and spoke about it in his speech, as if that's what his job is, to get us frequencies instead of solving the conflict. I was part of the previous debate. It took 12 years to get Israel to release the 3G frequencies, and they only did it for the West Bank. That dynamic is not seen, and so that's why we write about it. And actually, if I can mention one thing that I just recently wrote again, or published again, I wrote it a while ago, we have so many deaths and killings that go either unreported or are knocked out of the Israeli court system because the Israeli court system is part of this, this, this occupation. Yesterday, I was thinking what to write. And I remembered, I wrote an article in 2014 of a young girl, Iman Abu Homs, who got killed in Gaza in 2004. And the Israeli commander, shot her, and then radioed to whoever the base is and said, I'm going to confirm the kill. Walked up to the 14-year-old limp body on the ground with her backpack on and emptied his magazine into her and reported back, I've confirmed the kill. That went to court. And I watched it for 10 years before I wrote about it. I wanted to say, 
that Israel did something right by holding someone accountable. They dismissed him as if nothing was wrong. And add to that Gaza onslaught over Gaza onslaught over Gaza onslaught to today. And you can see the ongoing neck bay and how it links to the past in a very clear way. Gada, thank you, Sam. Gada, let me ask you, uh, in this country, um, there's been uh, um, much debate uh, nationally, as well as among within universities, as well as in states, about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and how that is uh, um, about cleansing our history and cleansing um, uh, the history of uh, not only true anti-Semitism, but also Israel's treatment of Palestinians. Can you say a word about uh, this, um, this redefinition of anti-Semitism and how that's part of the ongoing Nakba in our country? Yeah, well, you know, anti-Semitism should really be a wider thing, not a, not a narrower thing. Uh, however, if you speak about the anything Jewish, quote unquote, you're always accused of being anti-Semitic. So it's, it's useful. It's very useful for the other side to use it. Uh, we have to continue, however, attacking the other side using the proper terminology. I mean, I wouldn't call every Jew complicit. I would call anti-Semitic acts as anti-Semitic acts by Palestinian haters, let's say, Arab haters. But I wouldn't increase and widen the terminology like that. Thank you. I'd, I'd like for you to both maybe weigh in on this. Uh, you know, for us in the US, and Sam, you use this now a number of times today, settler colonial language is important since both the United States and Israel are settler colonial apartheid uh, projects uh, uh, that use the language of democracy, yet the reality is such that they're racist, exceptionalist, uh, 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 ideologies that oppress indigenous peoples and other people of color. But it seems to me, and tell me uh, if, if you think I'm wrong, I think people, especially young people, are getting it. They're, they're beginning to connect the intersectional dots, the connection between settler colonialism that's been the foundation of the U.S. and settler colonial Israel and all that that means. Gada, what do you think? I, yeah, I think there's a little bit better awareness of that the, than before. Uh, settler colonialism definitely exists in the Middle East and people I think are beginning to see it. It's very interesting that this new consciousness starts among the young. In other words, they're more open to new definitions. The older, <laughs> the older minds cling to kind of the older definitions. Thank you, uh, Sam. Yes, I mean, one thing I would point people to read if they have a chance, it's an article from Haaretz from away from 2014. It was uh, the late Israeli prize, Israel prize lottery. Uh, he's passed away since. He's a renowned scholar, was a renowned scholar. His name was Zev Sternheld. And Zen actually, Zev's actually in 2014, predicted where we are today, that Israel will lose its supposed democracy, fascists will come into the government, and the agenda will be completely hijacked to its original meaning of displacement of all Palestinians, regardless of where they are between the river and the sea. But I think, yes, many more, many more people than we believe, I think, get it. Not only in the US, but in Israel as well. I mean, on my blog, on the right-hand column all the way down, I actually list all of the Israeli human rights organizations that are worthy to follow, whether it's Breaking the Silence, Beit Salem, Yesh Din. There's many, many, many organizations. And now, and you ask what's going to be the pivotal moment, I actually think these demonstrations that are happening in Israel have revealed a pivotal moment that we can build on. And that is two things. One, the BDS movement is already working on, which is when investments stop flowing into Israel, 
Israeli politicians wake up, even if you're Netanyahu. And the second pillar of that pivotal moment is when the army starts to say, I'm not going to serve. That is a pivotal moment. We can talk about why they said that. Many of them didn't say it for the right reasons. They said it because they don't want to go to the Hague, which in itself implicates them as perpetrators of potential war crimes, but that's a story for another day. I look at the people like the 17-year-old high school Israeli student who last week published his article, why I'm telling the IDF no, why I'm not going to be part of this occupation at any cost, including the cost of his own freedom. And I remember Alice Lynn, my co-editor in our Homeland book, she is a lawyer who has focused her whole life on the refusenik movement when it was against Vietnam. And there's a convincing argument that when young people start to see that they are not only going to be implicated themselves for potential war crimes, but the morality of going and serving in this army is nothing about Jewish values, just the opposite. That's when I think the Israeli community, the younger folk will start to wake up. It's happening. It can only be accelerated to the pace we need it to accelerate if there's support of those from the outside, specifically the solidarity movement and within the solidarity movement, the Jewish component of it. Because again, there are no shared values other than what you mentioned between Palestine, Israel, and the US. The shared value is settler colonialism. That's not represented in the popul populace of the US, the populace of the synagogue congregations. I know what social justice means in the Jewish mindset. It should not be checked in when Jewish individuals arrive in Tel Aviv. Let's continue to serve that tradition of Judaism, of serving social justice and making sure that nothing is being done in their name, which is a war crime or apartheid. Sam, I'm gonna, I wanna just follow up with you for a second. Uh, and this can be a short answer, but, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. So that's why I'm asking. Is there, an, is there a higher rate now today of Jewish, uh, of young Jewish refuseniks? Uh, uh, is it increasing? I, I don't know, to be honest with you. This this last one was very uh, present in the media, so everyone saw it. What I do know is organizations like Breaking the Silence, although they're not refuseniks, just the opposite, they're combat soldiers. Right. When they come back into their community, they say what we did was wrong. And they've organized themselves in, a, in an amazing way to get to the Israeli public to the point where Israel has actually prohibited them from entering high schools. Yeah, because they know if the kids hear what they have to go and do, they'll be more refused next. So it's a dynamic that's happening. I can't really speak to how the numbers are, are, are matching, but I would assume as they see dead kids in the streets in Gaza and in Janine and elsewhere, that uh, Israelis are not, are not stupid people. And I believe the young people are smarter than all of other generations. They'll get it. And sooner or later, that will be the pivotal move. I have, thank you, Sam. I have one more question for you. And Gada, I'm going to start with you. And then Sam, I'm going to ask you about your daughters. So uh, uh, Gada, you've been, you've spent your life teaching. And I've begun to notice, and, and I can't quite put my finger on it. So that's why I'm asking you too. I've begun to notice a generational difference between our generation, your generation, you know, the Nakba and Intifada generations and your kids, you know, the next generation of kids and grandkids, in terms of how they understand resistance, their expectations for the future of Palestine and Israel and that relationship, their goals. Like I say, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'm detecting some something that's happening between your generation and then the next generation or two. Gada, uh, would you want to respond to that? And then Sam, I'm going to ask uh, if you've noticed that between you and your girls. Uh, it's really difficult to say. Uh, they know about all this history. They hear it from us. We're an embodiment of this. I mean, I mean they live it. But at the same time, you know, they're Americans. So <laughs> I mean, they grow up here. They have different interests. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult to motivate them, is what I'm saying. 
Thank you, Gada. Sam? There is definitely a generational difference between uh, the, the generations uh, either born here or born here and born abroad. Actually, Peter Bynard brought my daughter and myself into a one hour webinar on Peter Bynard Notebook. And we had a conversation, which I think reveals some of the differences. But our two daughters are currently in Cambridge, both of them working, uh, both of them very Palestinian, both of them very active, whether it's in the Boston Film Festival or whether it's in Harvard uh, with the Kathie Thursday uh, campaign yeah. that they had. Um, they're working hard to make sure the voice of Palestine is found within not only the chorus, which is nothing wrong with that, the solidarity movement, but they're going head to head with the institutions in the US like Harvard administration. And where does she get her momentum from? I mean, I wrote an article in 2007 about my daughter and the IDF and hamburgers. We're sitting in Angelo's pizzeria in the middle of Ramallah and an IDF undercover Jeep comes in and re reveals themselves, kills someone in the middle of the street, and my daughter didn't budge. She was into her hamburger. That is not a normal upbringing. And that sticks with you for life. And we're seeing that now as she approaches 23 and 24 years old. I'll put that article in the, in the chat. <laughs> and in terms of their expectations, their, their uh, uh, um, the Palestinian young people in Palestine itself. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, Sam. In, in Palestine and abroad is the same here. I think their expectations, because I cannot pin a specific issue on the Israelis. We have a weakness in leadership that has to be resolved. We need representative leadership. I desire it. My daughters and her generation demand it. They will not accept to follow a vacuum in terms of leadership. Why? They're smart kids. They know that without concentrated leadership, without real funding, without real campaigning, without real media work, we're not gonna get there. And they also are aware that as strong as our solidarity community is, it's mandatory that the national liberation movement directs it. And that's not happening today. So I think the younger generation is going to be even more outspoken about instilling a representative Palestinian leadership. Thank you, Sam. I, I wanna give uh, Gada and Sam an opportunity to share their parting thoughts with us in just, in just a, a few minutes. But before I do, let me share the screen here. Uh, I want to ask uh, Don Wagner, who's going to speak on behalf of the Chicago Faith Coalition, to share with us uh, matters, uh, 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 that, uh, share with us some opportunities for advocacy that need our urgent attention. And you'll find their links uh, in the chat. So, Don, I've got two slides. The first three uh, advocacy items are here, and then we'll go over to the second slide, okay? Okay. Take it away, Don. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike, Sam, Gada, and Hassan. Very moving. And now, you know, we in the West, primarily, I think we have Americans, Canadians, a few Europeans. We have great responsibility, particularly we in the U.S., as our tax dollars keep this catastrophe, this Nakba going. So I want to mention a few things we can do in the coming weeks and months. And I'm assuming now it's not listed that we're going to continue with BDS, which was is one of the strongest advocacy pieces we can do. Absolutely. And we also need, it's been mentioned, Shireen Abu Akla, that we demand that the U.S. admit and release the report the State Department seems to be hiding. So those two are not listed here, but I want to just mention them. First on the list is that the bill to stop the detention of Palestinian children has a new number, and we need to get on our representatives and even our senators to be co-signers. Betty McCollum has taken the lead. The number is 3103, and you can get that text by clicking the link there, but make sure you contact your local representative, at least the representatives 
to join on as co-sponsors. If we have a real strong push across the country, I hope we can get those numbers up toward 50, 60. Second, Tent of Nations, which is a farm in the West Bank many of us have visited. Uh, they are constantly in a battle uh, to prove that they own the farm and their deed goes back to 1916. Uh, but they have a hearing coming up, I believe it's Monday or Tuesday. Push your representative to demand that they get that registration authorizing their ownership. Because we fear what could happen with Ben Gavir and Schmolich uh, running things in the West Bank. They want that and they covered that 100 acre farm. Third, take note of the public rallies. They're going on all around the country. Uh, there'll be one in Chicago. Uh, I believe it's the 26th. Our friends at AMP is leading it. They have a flag raising ceremony at 1130, Friday the 26th at Daly Plaza. We should get out and support that. And then there'll be a rally and a march toward the Israeli consulate. And as we remember this, I, I also want to make sure we remember the prisoners, the late Khadr Adnan, who lost his life 87 days on a hunger strike, and the Israelis denied him hospital care. Uh, they're, the blood of Khadr is on their hands. And in his will, he wrote this, my dear Palestinian people, do not despair. Regardless of what the occupiers do, our victory is close. We have to not only imagine, but do our work so we bring that closer. Fourth, a number of our churches, Jewish Voice for Peace, I think AMP, have been part of a project that's ready to launch the first week of June. It's called Apartheid Free Communities. This is going to be a year or two long project year or two year long project. If you click on the link here, you can scroll down and and see the pledge that we are going to be asking of our churches, our universities, our synagogues, our mosques, that we create a movement that's anti-apartheid. And in the process, we expose the apartheid that Israel is imposing through its settler colonial practices. So check that out. That's coming right up. And finally, I think we need very much to push our senators and our representatives, and this is a tough one, to join and co-sign the Bernie Sanders and Jamal Bowman letter calling for U.S. military aid to be scrutinized, evaluated for violation of the Leahy Law and the U.S. Arms Control Act. These are two congressional bills that are not reinforced when it comes to Israel. Israel is violating these bills with the bombing of Gaza and the targeted assassination of Palestinians up and down the West Bank. So one way we can work on that is to call for our tax dollars that give Israel the weapons and the permission for these violations, call them to be scrutinized, evaluated, because they're violating our own laws. So those are some ways we can uh, begin to stay active and move on it this week, next week, and the, and the weeks to come. And I just want to thank all of our co-sponsors. I want to thank AMP uh, for getting this remarkable interview with Hassan. Sam is such a powerful uh, voice on the ground. And uh, I hope you'll put the... Uh, you know, that new article or the old one about uh, about Iman in, in the web or, or in the chat so we can read it. That will move you, I hope, to action to see the ongoing Nakba. And Gada, thank you very much. So grateful to have this time together and thank you all for joining us across the country and around the world. Don, thank you. Uh, Don and Linda, uh... I don't have the chat room in front of me here because I have the, the screen of our co-sponsors up, but I'm, uh, I'm assuming, right, that you've listed all those links now in the chat so people could actually cut and paste those out of the chat room into a, a document for themselves that they can keep. 
Uh, am I correct in saying that, Don and Linda? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Linda's Linda's posted them. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, for doing that uh, that labor of love. And Don, thank you, uh, you and Linda too, for and all the Chicago Faith Coalition for uh, um, uh, reminding us of these advocacy items. You see before you, folks, uh, our co-sponsors, and so I want to I want to say thanks to them. I want to say thanks to uh, the Chicago Faith Coalition uh, for their partnership uh, in this webinar. And I want to remind you all that you'll be able to find this inter this webinar on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel next week. And each one of our co-sponsors uh, will be receiving this link as well. Mike, so, can I also add something? Can I also thank everybody for their solidarity and um, their support? Thank you very much for that, Rama. And Please. I want to shout out to Mike. Thank you, Mike, for your wonderful moderating. And uh, I just, the Indiana Center is doing remarkable work. And uh, if you feel so moved, send them a donation. They're a model uh, for education and advocacy. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Linda. And thank you to all of you. Now I want to give uh, Gada and Sam a uh, chance to share with us some parting thoughts. Gada, uh, what would you like to say to us as we close about uh, the Nakba at 75, the ongoing Nakba, and uh, our responsibilities for justice? Well, I would hope and I dream that the Nakba will be remembered across the US. I mean, I mean, not only among certain peace circles, it has to become, I think, as commonly recognized as the Holocaust. We talk about the Holocaust all the time. We have to talk about other people's Holocaust. And I think the most moving Holocaust, Nakba, if you wish, around the world, are those affecting indigenous people. And that's really the Palestinian case. Thank you so much, Gada. Sam? Thank you. I'd like to add to Don's list the recent, only two days ago, introduced legislation by Congresswoman Rashid Talib. Rashida actually produced legislation for the US to officially recognize the Nekbe, not to send their military to solve the issue, to recognize the Nekbe. If our lawmakers cannot take that simple step, it shows us how much work we have to do. Secondly, we can no longer continue to call this an Israeli military occupation. This is a US-Israeli military occupation and ongoing neck pain, and we should never forget that. Lastly, I'll close by noting one of the Jewish sages, someone famous in Judaism from the 17th century, Rabbi Nachman from Brachlech, once said, quote, there is nothing that is more whole than a broken heart, unquote. We Palestinians have a whole heart and thankfully partly due to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And I have, uh, I see a hand from one of our uh, uh, AMP folks. And so um, we don't have time for all kinds of questions now, but Nita, since you're part of the planning, what would you like to share with us? I, I just uh, thank you for letting me uh, speak. I just want to uh, say how uh, wonderful it is to see uh, this solidarity here uh, today. Uh, I mean, you as a Palestinian working in uh, Chicago and in the U.S., uh, you get down, you see all these things happening and all. Uh, and, and it's just a, a fresh, uh, a breath of fresh air to uh, see and work with the Faith Coalition and, and see the, the, the support. Uh, so when I'm done, when, when I need a little bit of support, I, I, I come to you guys. And so I would like to thank you so much for everything you do for the Palestinian people. Shukra, Nida. Yeah, Nida, thank you so much. Don and Linda, the, the Chicago Faith Coalition uh, check them out on Facebook and on their um, uh, webpage. Uh, Sam, Gada, we need to uh, say thank you. Rama, please send our gratitude to Hassan uh, for his insights and his sharing of his story. And we hope to see you uh, at one of our events. And please note those advocacy items that Don shared and that Linda put in the chat room. I'll leave I'll leave uh, the webinar open for another minute if you'd like to go to the chat room 
and uh, uh, copy and paste those links. But with that, I will say assalamu alaikum. Thank you to Gada and Sam, and thanks to all of you on behalf of the Chicago Faith Coalition and Indiana Center for Middle East Peace.